everybody, it's Dr. Greg Jones here with the Optimization Academy. I hope you guys love that name. Uh, it's so original and you know, so far no one's said anything bad about it. So we're gonna go with it. And I am extremely honored today to have Dr. Matthew Cook with me. Uh, Dr. Cook is kind of a legend in the regenerative medicine space for those who are familiar with that. You know, I've been stalking him for the last few weeks about doing this podcast and I finally wrangled him. I, I may have pretended I was someone else, but we got him here and I'm excited. So, so Dr. Cook is president and founder of Bio, uh, Bio Reset Medical and medical advisor of the Bio Reset Network. He's a board certified anesthesiologist for over 20 years of experience in practicing medicine. And a lot of that time has been spent in the functional regenerative medicine space. So with that being said, um, you know, Dr. Cook does treatments ranging from pain, a complex illness, to anti-aging and wellness. He treats very challenging cases. And so that's one of my introductions to him and some of the lectures I've been in just discussing difficult cases. I'm like, man, that's just awesome the way he thinks, it th thinks about things and addresses and approaches things. And also, you know, not just pain, treating patients with Lyme disease and PTSD and, and mycotoxin illnesses and across the board. So Dr. Cook's approach is to use the most non-invasive, natural and integrative ways possible. So with that being said, we want to welcome Dr. Cook and I really appreciate this. Oh man, Greg, thank you for having me. It's awesome to talk to you. And it's so cool that uh, you were at uh, a couple of the lectures that I get, got a chance to give. And so it's great to circle the circle the connection and uh, let's get started. Oh, definitely, definitely. So today we're gonna to be talking about peptides. So this is my second peptide talk, but we're gonna drill down and get a little bit more specific today. <clears throat> and again, we talked early before you guys got on, this may be the first in a series, but we're gonna focus on, you know, a little background on peptides, getting to some immune modulators and then kind of springboard that into talking about peptides used in pain and regenerative injections in medicine. So the first thing I want to ask you about, and this is a question that I get a lot because, you know, like I'm kind of a peptide nerd myself and I love peptides and what they've done for my patients. And so we usually, you know, when you get those newer patients who are not familiar with peptides and you say, Hey, I want to talk to you about peptides. And they give you the, the eyebrow raise and it's like, well, what are peptides? And so I'd like to ask you, how do you answer that question? And how do you, you know, introduce that to your patients and explain that to them. Okay, that's a good one. Um, so I've got, uh, I'm, I'm pouring myself some delicious green tea. No worries. So that's a good one. I, it turns out, um, I got a handful of different ways I talk about that. But one way to think about it is that the human body has a bunch of different glands and organs. And then what these different glands and organs do is they they sense what's happening and then they do something about whatever they see. And so one, one thing that a lot of people have heard of is you know that um, we, we have a pancreas and the pancreas measures your blood sugar and kind of manages your blood sugar. And the way that it uh, manages your blood sugar is if your blood sugar gets too high it secretes this molecule called insulin and insulin lowers your blood sugar and kind of makes, keeps it normal. And so, uh, <clears throat> and so some people have a problem with their pancreas. And so because they have a problem and they can't make insulin, then they inject it. Well, it turns out insulin is the most famous peptide in the world. So insulin is a peptide now, the, and it's too big of a molecule to be able to take it as a pill and absorb it. Um, uh, and, and so what we do is we take and we give it as a little subcutaneous injection with a little tiny insulin needle. And, um, and so it turns out all of the peptides that we use are basically baby proteins and they do something and they're bioidentical to, to the actual peptide that is in our body for the most part. And so then uh, peptides are things that have an effect on human physiology. And we use them uh, different ones depending on how patients present with different issues. That's great. And, and I think that's a good way to look at it, starting with what someone knows and going to it, you know, like, hey, let's relate it to what it does in the body. And so one thing I, I 
I don't want to say I pride myself on is I try to do analogies with people. It's kind of like my trademark and some of them hit the mark. Some of them don't make any sense at all. And one of the ones I love when I explain what peptides do is I'll use the analogy of a, of a doorbell and I'll say, hey, you know, with peptides, just imagine if I ring the doorbell and that signal goes throughout the house and it's like, Hey, I'm ringing the doorbell and it may be heard in different rooms and it's going to tell, Hey, someone's at the door, make something happen where sometimes there are certain medications and hormones. It's like that, hor like that person went in the house and went in every single room and started yelling at you. And some people are meant to hear that and some people aren't. And the people who aren't, those are your side effects, you know? So it's really kind of making, you know, the connection between what it's doing in the body. I don't know if that's a good one. That's the one I like doing. You know that's a good one. I'm going to, I'm going to use, I'm going to, I'm going to somewhat steal that. Okay. <laughs> steal that now, yeah. but and now, so then we got 30 million people in North America injecting peptides, i.e. insulin every mm -hmm. day. Yeah. Now, it turns out that that peptide is a signal that's going all over the body. And that signal is kind of one thing. Mm -hmm. That is a signal to open up glucose channels and drive sugar into cells. So then, so I like where this conversation is going because what that means is there, it turns out there are thousands of peptides that the human body makes. Each one is a signal that does a different thing. And so there are some signals that are kind of like a doorbell that just wake up everybody in the whole house. There are some signals that send a message to the kitchen. There are some signals that send a message to the living room. There's another signal that might just send a message to the couch in the living room. And so then the name of the game is to understand the biology of the whole house. And then once I have that and I kind of know the problems and the problems is you didn't make the bed this morning and the kitchen's a mess, but basically otherwise it's fine. And so then yeah. if that's, and, and, and so then these are, and the common problems that we have in biology are common, just like the common problems in our house. Mm -hmm. And so then basically what we need to do is start to send some signals that are gonna clean that bedroom up, make the bed, clean up the laundry. We got some other signals that are gonna clean up that kitchen and we're gonna clean up, just send a message to spruce up the pillows on that couch. And then it's gonna look like a beautiful house. Everybody's gonna feel great in that house. Right. And that's kind of one way to think about um, peptides. Good, good. So I'm going to take my analogy, steal yours, and we'll just kind of make it a package of, of house analogies here. And so it's just so now, amazing to think about that way. Now then, that's great. I like that. Now, then what I want to add on to that is everything in human biology is signaling. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for example, it used to be that we had this idea that a stem cell was going to show up on the scene and like look and see that there was like some cartilage damage and then go turn itself into a cartilage cell and then heal that. Okay. Turns out that's not really what happens. What a stem cell does is it shows up, it sees there's some inflammation and then it starts to make signaling molecules. Now, the signals in the human body are sometimes cytokines, sometimes they're hormones, sometimes there's other small molecules, and then sometimes they're peptides. So there's a whole bunch of different, and sometimes they're vitamins, but these can be signals that can represent energy, they can represent a doorbell turning things on, they could represent something that turns things off. Um, and so then now the name of the game is to begin to kind of talk through biology and then determine as we're working through what the main structural problems are and then which type of signaling uh, tools we can use to influence biology. Exactly. And that's an amazing way to think about it as well. So I'm going to do a quick gear shift here away from the doorbells. And so I know we wanted to structure this around, you know, in the pain and regenerative medicine space. But as we talked before, we can't really get into that space until we get into the immune modulating space. So 
I think this is where we want to talk about, you know, starting with the thymocins. And if you'd like to talk about, you know, how those immune modulating, you know, how those peptides work or why we want to use them and how we can transition into how they're beneficial in the pain and regenerative medicine space. Okay, that's a great end question. That, that was a good one. I'm going to sort of talk you through the immune system. And the immune system is super interesting. The immune system is, um, it, you know how they have like the man of the year and the woman of the year? Mm -hmm. Definitely for 2020, the immune oh. system is going <laughs> yeah. to be the system of the year. So something that everybody's kind of uh, suddenly become interested in. And that's because if the immune system is not working great and then something happens, like you get coronavirus, if your immune system's on the ropes, then coronavirus is going to run all over you. And so one of the things that everybody's trying to do on the planet right now is kind of build up their immune system. Um, when, when there are a variety of problems that, that happen in life, the immune system can start to get stressed. And when the immune system gets stressed, it, it doesn't work quite as well as it could and it starts to have problems. And we call this immune dysfunction. Uh, one of the examples of it, the most common one is something called autoimmunity, where the immune system, instead of attacking invaders, it starts to attack yourself. Um, uh, one of the things that can happen is people can get a lot of inflammation in their gut and then that can spill over into the, 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 the blood and the vascular system, which can lead to inflammation all over. And in general, uh, inflammation in the body can lead to stress for the immune system. And so what I try to do is I try to talk to people and get a sense of, and I can generally do this fairly quickly, just from talking to people, to, I'll get a sense of, does this person have an immune problem and whatever else problem they came to see me for? So they may be coming to see me for their knee pain, but there may be an immune component to the story or there may be just the picture of health. So for example, I might have one person that comes to see me and they've got leaky gut and they got food poisoning and they've been having abdominal symptoms and gas and bloating for years. And they've got, you know, a variety of other problems that all came on after their leaky gut and, and they're not sleeping and they're stressed and two or three other things. So that might be one person. And then I got another person like you, you're a naturopathic doctor, you've been doing everything right you're on all the right programs, but you might have this knee pain. So what I do is I try to sort out when I'm talking to people which category they're in. Um, if everything is straight up perfect, the, it, like maybe in your case, and my hypothetical knee pain case that I have of you, then I say, oh, okay, great. And then I'm just gonna take me down one road. If I'm really, feeling like the immune system is stressed and there's a bunch of immune problems going on, then I go with the number one immune peptide and that immune peptide is called thymosin, alpha one. So there's two main peptides. They both regulate the immune system. One is called, one is alpha and one is beta. So it's kind of easy to remember. Uh, and uh, the name for the one that's alpha is alpha one, and the beta one is beta four. Peptides all have kind of crazy names, so it's kind of hard to remember them when you first we hear them, but then once you get used to them, um, it's a little bit easier. And so the important reason why I tell you this is, and this is, I, I tell you, I've found this, and if people hear this, it will really, really be helpful. This is a great insider tip. A lot of times there are people and they've, they have had all of this gastrointestinal stuff. They might have mold, they might have Lyme, they've had chronic fatigue, they might've had Epstein-Barr or mono, 
They might have had some other viral problems and their immune system has been stressed. They might have taken a lot of antibiotics when they were young. A lot of those people, they want to jump to regenerative medicine because they've got joint pain and they want to get better. Those people, what I always do is I say, you know what, this is a real immune out of control thing and we're going to do a little bit of functional medicine, start to dial things in and I'm going to put you on this thymus and alpha-1 peptide. And so thymus and alpha-1 is a great peptide to start to regulate the immune system and it's, it seems to balance it. Now, it's interesting to, for me to just mention the dosing here for people if they want to get started on it. The traditional dose that people will start at is, is 500 micrograms a day, okay? If I talk to somebody who I mentioned all of these things, if they've got all of it, I start them at one or 200 micrograms a day. I start them real low. And then I'll have them do that dose for two or three days and double it and go for two or three days and double it till I get them up to 500. And then I'll have them stay there for a few weeks. What I have found is I have kind of a, a practice where I take care of a lot of complex illness, people flying in from all over the world for injections. And we take care of a lot of people with Lyme disease, for example. Uh, Lyme disease is really has a strong association with autoimmune disease and with immune dysregulation. And what I'll do is I will start people low and slow on these peptide protocols. And a lot of times, I, you know, I, I just saw four or five people who I talked to in um, April. And I got them going on the peptides and I started in them real low at 200 micrograms and I worked their way up to 500 and slowly got them up to 750. And they all came into the office and they said, you know what, uh, it took a while, it took a few months, but I'm about 30 or 40% better. One of them said, I'm 20% I'm better, but I feel, like, I feel like what we're gonna do is gonna work because nothing's ever gotten me better. And so, what that peptide was doing, the peptide, the thymosin, it helps your white blood cells make antibodies. It regulates the way that they do it. It helps your white blood cells actually kill bacteria and viruses. Uh, if you're a little immunocompromised, i.e. your immune system is not working quite as well as it could, it, it seems to bring it back up to being less immunocompromised. And those animal models that they've done that proved, proved that it did it in animal models. And so then what we do is we will try to get people on a program like this. And often what, it'll take a little while. Sometimes it'll take a couple of weeks. Sometimes it'll take a month. But really often people will start to say, man, I'm feeling better. And then I know that I've done the right thing and I started them in the right place. Now, the other peptide that remember i said there's alpha and beta so the other peptide that is comes from the thymus gland and it turns out remember i said there's glands and organs the thymus gland is the home base of your immune system it's where everything happens and your whole immune system is centered in there and so there's uh, two main peptides that come from the thymus gland. And the thymus and beta-4 is really important for regulating the immune system. And in particular, it seems to regulate the immune inflammatory component, not just of the immune system, but of the nervous system. Because your immune system is to some extent embedded in your gastrointestinal and your nervous system. So we're constantly working with this triad of systems and how they're interacting with each other. And so then typically what I'll do is I'll, for, for the people with kind of the immune version of it, I'll get them going on the thymus and alpha one first. And then shortly after I'll layer in thymus and beta. And so then the protocol that we'll use is if I started somebody at 200 and then I might have worked them up to 750 over a week or two, then a lot of times in week two, I'll layer in the thymus and beta. Uh, 
people don't have as many side effects. And so as long as they're relatively healthy, I'll start them right at 500 and then work them up to 750. Um, if I feel like they're fragile or if they've had a hard time or if they had kind of quote unquote Herxheimer reactions where they had detox reactions from other medications or other treatment programs, then I just go much more slowly and carefully as I kind of onboard them to what we're doing. Okay, and that's pretty awesome. And now here's a question, um, and I've seen this from a few pharmacies and, and some of the literature that I've seen in protocols. Is there a time limit on how long you can use the thymus sense? Because I've seen six weeks, I've seen two months, and if there is, why? So to some extent, there are, there are feedback loops within the body. And so then, for example, like hormones, the good thing about it, if you, if your, if your hormones are low, like for example, uh, if you've got no testosterone, I can give you testosterone. If I give you testosterone, your body may stop making it. Okay. Now, uh, there may be kind of a, a hypothetical reason to think, well, if somebody, uh, if, if, if somebody is fragile, we don't want to just do all the work of the immune system. We want to get the immune system to do some of its own work as well. Now, what I will tell you is I think of it a little differently than that. I don't have a rule as explicitly as that. But what I do is I'm always cycling my peptides. So almost everybody I'm working with is on two or three peptides. If I had this person that had leaky gut, some parasites, some inflammation, that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, they had chronic fatigue and they had Lyme and they'd been on this like this for a long time and they came in and they had knee pain. What I would do is I would get them going on the thymus and alpha one. I might have them do that for a month or two and then once that they were stable with that, and I had them on the, I added on thymus and beta four. What I'll do is I'll rotate those out and rotate some other peptides in. And so then by rotating out your body, it's kind of like if you went to the gym and then you changed up your program all the time. I have muscle confusion, so you never know exactly. Uh, what your, your muscles never know what you're getting. And in the same way, I'm rotating through my protocols. That being said, you know, there are certain situations. So let me give you an example. I got some people with catastrophically crazy post COVID. Okay. So these people are in 10 out of 10 immune stress. And so most of those people, I tell them, I'm going to put you on thymus and alpha one, and you're going to probably be on this for six months. If I've got a really bad case of Lyme disease, I'll tell them you're probably going to be on thymus and alpha one for six months. We're probably going to, we may rotate you out and then rotate you back in. Often I'll, I'll have them on a protocol where they'll be on thymus and alpha one and thymus and beta four. Understand that I'm dealing with some fairly significant immune problems. Um, or uh, if you came to see me and you were super healthy, then what I might, I'm going to probably rotate you through, but you're going to rotate through shorter cycles. Okay. That's pretty cool. That's a good way to look at it as well. And I like the, you know, and it's, it's so funny because I was like, oh, we're going to talk about just the regenerative medicine piece, but understanding. And this is, this is right up my alley right here as a naturopathic physician, because we're always looking at treating the root cause. And so it's uh, the temptation is, especially as someone who loves injecting is like, oh, you've got knee pain. I'm going to inject the hell out of your knee because that's, you know, that's the fun, sexy part of it in many ways. But making sure that we get better outcomes by looking at the whole person. And again, like you said, there may be immune dysfunction and maybe other things that need to be addressed before you get to that point. And so that being said, you know, once we're at a point where you've addressed all the root cause stuff, immune system is calmed down and nice and modulated. And now it's like, okay, we've done all that. And whether it be imaging, whether it be orthopedic exams, like, okay, you have this injury. Now we're going to transition to the point where we're actually treating that injury directly. How do you bring in peptides into that space? Okay. Can I, can I, can I say one thing before we go there? Oh yeah, sure. 
Okay, this could be good. So it turns out that um, when I'm thinking about a joint, I'm, I'm, remember I actually, when I gave that lecture, I gave that lecture about the five compartments of pain. So there can be pain in the bone. If I go from inside to outside, there can be pain in the bone marrow. There can be pain in the joint. There can be pain in the joint capsule. There can be pain in the um, nerves that are outside the joint. And then there can be pain in the ligaments and tendons and fascia, and then even in the arteries and veins. So I can have pain in any of those categories. It turns out, and, and this is, I think, going to be probably the defining, one of the defining things of my life. And, and what, I've, what I've figured out from my clinical experience is the people who are in that first category with a lot of immune problems seem to have much more immune inflammation of their nerves. So for example, Lyme patients have a lot of immune problems in their nerves. Um, uh, autoimmune patients do. A lot of times the rheumatoid and autoimmune patients will have more immune inflammation of their nerves. And so then what happens is you say to yourself, well, what are we getting? So they've got an, an immune problem with their nerve. So we've got to do something that's going to help them regulate that nerve. Well, how are we going to do that? What could we do to regulate the immune system around that nerve? It's interesting. My friend Mark Hyman was here last week, and so we were talking a lot. And we were talking, and he was saying, you know, I feel like if I really do a good job on functional medicine, he said, a lot of times what happens is all of a sudden that, um, that, um, that immune pain will go away and all of a sudden the knee pain goes away. And we used to think that a lot of Lyme patients had joint pain and certainly many do, but a lot of them don't have much in the way of joint pain, but they just have nerve pain and in the nerve that goes to that joint. And so then what I found is I can put those peptides by the nerve. And when I do that, it modulates the nerve right there. So now I could inject that peptide just like I was in doing an insulin injection or in my belly. I could also, in the subcutaneous tissue over the knee, inject that peptide down by the knee. Okay? Or I could take it a step further and I could get my ultrasound out. I could look and I could see that nerve. And then I could take a needle in and I could put fluid with peptides around that nerve. When I do that, when I do any one of those things, that will start to regulate the immune component of that nerve. And a lot of times those people will do a lot better. And peripheral neuropathy is in that category. So, so then what can happen is, what, so then I'm, when I'm doing a regenerative medicine consult, I have my mind on that. And so then if I, if imagine I had somebody that had a mild case and I realized, oh, okay, let's say they, they, they had some mild immune dysfunction and it seemed like they have some nerve pain because I do a neurological exam and I touch all those nerves and I look at it with their ultrasound. If I think there's something immune going on and they've got nerve pain, then what I'll do is I'll do a hydrodissection of that joint, I mean of that nerve, and then I'll also treat their joint. So I might make platelet-rich plasma or something like that, and then inject that into the joint, but then I'll also do a nerve hydrodissection to the nerve. The other thing that I'll do, and I've started doing this with a, a really a great success, is I'll do a nerve hydrodissection and then I'll teach the patient how to do some subcutaneous injections by where that nerve is. And so then they can keep the healing going on in that nerve. And so we're doing a lot with teaching and making videos and coaching people. And then I'm noticing that that's super helpful. So then that is 
kind of category one. Now then let's say I got category two. I just got this straight up person, super healthy. They don't have anything on the immune side, but they may have some nerve pain and they may have some joint pain. So then we might make a decision that we wanted to do platelet-rich plasma for both of those people. Now, when I see nerve pain, uh, I'm gonna use, I'm, whether that person has a real bad immune problem or they're just healthy, my number one nerve hydrodissection solution is thymus and beta-4, okay? So that's number one. Um, and so I'll use that in either one. Uh, the person with no immune problems, I may not even bother with thymus and alpha-1, okay? I may go straight to just thymus and beta-4. When we, we also will do combinations of thymus and alpha-1 and BPC-157, and we'll do that both for fascia for, and for nerves uh, and uh, for hydrodissection. Okay, that's awesome. That's the sound of me ordering a lot of thymus and alpha one and beta four because that is an amazing solution. Um, because you know, we I've been doing perineural injection with a lot of my joint injections as well, just because oh. I, I think about I think about Wilson's law and it's like, hey, if I know I have this joint pain, I'm most likely I'm going to have nerve pain supplying the joint, and it's just a combination therapy, you know, especially if it's indicated. But that's kind of good for me. Maybe some other docs that are listening is using those peptides in a, you know, a novel way of treating the nerve pain. Because for me, I've always thought when I think nerve pain, to be very honest, I've always thought cerebral lysin, which is another peptide, which, you know, it's kind of difficult to get, but I always thought about that one. And this is a, a good way to think about it and actually probably a little bit more affordable for the patient as well um, to look at that as well. So that's excellent right there. So I love cerebral lysin for, for that. Okay, it's a home, that's a home run, but it's yeah. difficult. It's difficult to get. Mm -hmm. um, now, you brought up a, a great concept, and so I'm going to take you all the way down this road. And so, um, imagine if uh, if we looked at a piece of tissue, and so then very superficially is their subcutaneous tissue and there's a bunch of nerves. So for example, superficially there's skin and nerves and then underneath that there's muscles and then all the way down there's the bone. Now it turns out the nerves that go to the skin are the same nerves that go to the, to the bone that's underneath the skin for the most part, okay? And so then there was this guy who's a friend of mine and who's been a mentor and an influence to me, and I love him. He's a great human being and a great person, and his name is John Liftoff. And so he came up with something that was called NeuroProlo, and so then they turned what they did into perineural injection technique and or the Liftoff method. And so their idea was is that if you did a little tiny subcutaneous injection to the superficial nerves and calmed them down, that would heal the nerve and that would make the pain both superficially and deep down in the bone go away. Now that's a provocative idea. And in general, I think that there's quite a bit of validity to that approach. And I'm, I'm a fan of that approach. Now, the approach and the concept that Dr. Liftoff had was that with the um, nerve is that the nerve was in a state of low glucose. And if there's a lack of blood flow or impingement and there's not enough glucose to that nerve, it puts the nerve in spasm and pain. Okay. And so they call that glucopenia. Okay. This is what his, his intellectual concept is. And so then he said, oh, okay. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to palpate. I'm going to find that nerve and then put some glucose subcutaneously. And often if you're treating a joint, but you put some glucose superficially, it will calm down that superficial nerve. And then they'll, they'll actually, their joint will feel better. 
And so this is a, this is, it seems kind of wacky, but I, the science is pretty good. And the concept is what they have found is, is that that low glucose triggers these certain um, nerve, uh, nerves uh, called trp one receptors to be uh, out of control and in pain. What I have personally found is that I get about 10 times better results if I do a perineural injection with thymus and beta-4 than I do if I, if I use glucose. And that is because thymus and beta-4 is regulating that, that, that nerve. And then what I do is I make a judgment call when I'm looking at that person and I say, is this, is this somebody with immune stuff or no immune stuff? If there's no immune stuff, then when I do that perineural type of injection, I'll do BPC-157 and thymus and beta-4. And then what you'll do is you'll take, um, you'll take about a, a two to one, three to one, or four to one ratio. And so four parts thymus and beta-4 to one part BPC-157, because our workhorse of healing the nerve is thymus and beta-4. So we're going to have more thymus and beta-4 than BPC-157. However, we're also going to have the BPC-157 in there. BPC-157 has a bunch of benefits for vasculature. So it's healed, and, and those, those nerves have blood vessels that are by them. And, but the only thing is for people that are real sick and inflamed, I think BPC-157 starts a little too much healing too quickly and can irritate people. And so I'm, this is why I'm kinda, I said, we're gonna have a little bit of an immune conversation because we're making this judgment call. And then it saves you because if you've got somebody with a problem and then you do thymus and beta-4 by itself, it's like they're gonna do great. And then, and then that person, you fix their nerve with thymus and beta-4, you did an amazing treatment to their joint, and then you started them on systemic thymus and alpha-1, and you're going to work them forward. Once you do that for about a month, a lot of times that's when I'll start to add in BPC-157. And BPC, these guys all have interesting names for what they are. Um, the thymus and peptides, and I'm not going to talk about any more peptides, so I won't overwhelm you. But so we only got three. So I've got this, the pe two peptides from the thymus gland, thymus and gland, alpha and beta. And then, but this BPC-157 is an interesting one. It stands for body protection compound. And all, all drugs basically just to have kind of a number. And so it's BPC-157. It turns out that this compound is secreted from your stomach. And w I think basically when God designed us, he knew that we were kind of hooligans. He knew that it was not going to be pretty. And so what, or she did, maybe she did. And so then what happened is, is when um, we eat, our stomach secretes this compound that's a protective anti-inflammatory compound that goes into our intestines and just keeps all of our junctions of our cells super tight, keeps us healthy, anti-inflammatory, and has a bunch of benefits to the blood vessels and nerves and stuff like that. And so, and it, it turns out to be an amazing compound that you can inject pretty much all over the body. Uh, some people like to put it into joints. Sometimes some people like to use it for ligaments and tendons and fascia. And some people like to use it for nerves and perineural injection. I have found personally that when you go down this perineural road, you're going to make this judgment immune or non-immune, and then you may or may not use it. But then a lot of times you get people so much better in a few months, then you just start using it after that, and then they do great. And that is the secret to going low and slow for your immune patients. Okay. Now, I'm going to circle back and ask you a question as a, as a, as a doc. Uh, this is 
some of the for maybe some other doctors watching as well. Now with peri neuro with lift off method, I know that in most injection sites, I'm doing anywhere from a half CC to a full CC, depend, depending on the nerve and the location and the amount of pain. Now with those peptides, are you diluting them? Because, you know, you may have a lot of nerve pain. If you're going down the whole, you know, path of that nerve, that's a lot of injection sites. So are you pretty much going to where the pain generator is, or are you just kind of treating the entire route? Because I'm just thinking about volume wise. And that's, how many that's, a, that's a fantastic question. That's my kind of question. Uh, the, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, uh, a nuanced answer that's going to be helpful for you. I don't dilute it. So I leave okay. it where it is. But what happens is it tends to be so effective that where you used to do 10 injections, you're just going to figure out clinically where the two worst spots are. And so then you're going to treat those two spots. Okay. okay. Now, the problem is, is that if you were now, so then I do this and I'm teaching this. And in the next two or three weeks, we're going to uh, have a, a video a page where every day I take a day off, every week I'm taking a day off and just sh shooting videos and showing people how to do this stuff. Now, traditionally the problem is, is with liftoff, you were gonna have to go back to that doctor and he was gonna inject you and then you're not gonna see him for a month and you're gonna come back in a month and he's gonna treat you again. But what's gonna happen with your patients is you're gonna, there might be 10 spots where there's pain and you might only treat the two worst ones. And interestingly, you can go up a little, if there's areas of pain, what I found is you can go up and give a higher dose than the traditional doses that have been advocated. So I will go, uh, I will, I use higher doses when I'm treating people and, and people tend to do fine with that. No, there's some nuances and I'm gonna, I'll talk about this with you as we go. Uh, there's quite a bit of nuances on that. But then what I do is I'm teaching the patient and you're going to be teaching the patient how to do this themselves. And so then tomorrow they're going to go home because you're going to open up that file and you're going to inject them two or three or four times. But then they're going to go home and you might even mark those spots for them. And then they're going to inject those other spots every day. And so of those 10 spots, you might treat four today. They're going to treat another four tomorrow. They're going to treat another four the next day. So That's next right. thing you know, they're doing, they're giving themselves in 10 days, they're doing 40 injections. And then okay. what happens typically is people come back and they go, you know, like of those 10 spots, the pain's 100% gone in like four or five of them and it's mostly gone in two or three of them. There's one area where it still is. Sometimes that is the place where I end up going in and doing my nerve hydro dissection. But you know, what happened to me in COVID, and this is what kind of sent me down this road, I just had one person after another, I was uh, telling these people call me and they're like, guess what? My country is closed. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come see you in 2021. You know, and uh, and so then I started sending people peptides and doing video calls and teaching them how to do these injections. And then next thing you know, I started getting people calling me saying, hey, you know what? Um, it's super nice to meet you. I used to have pain, but then I, I, I started in doing these peptides. I don't have that pain anymore. So I, I'm not going to come see you. But that was super awesome. And yeah. so then now then and then then they're so they're like, well, what else do you want to do now that that's gone? And so then mm -hmm. there's it's like clinical practice changed because of COVID. And I just think it's been like the greatest, you know, five months of my life personally. And so what I'm doing is I'm trying to help point people in positive directions, but then to begin to realize that our potential and what we can do, I think is gonna really evolve in an amazing way.
Okay. That's awesome. And that's just it, just being able to help people. And it's, I had a talk with one of my mentors a couple uh, interviews ago, we we're talking about the, not so much down the pathway of the, the business of regenerative medicine is that you get people better. And it's like, like you said, it's like, all right, I'm good. Thanks doc. Bye. But then that's where it goes into treating the whole person is sometimes it's not just that and getting, gaining that trust with the patient and all that. So that's an excellent thing. Um, we started down this path earlier and I don't know if there's something we can address here is that are there instances where you're looking to do any intraarticular peptide injections? So, uh, so there's, there are some, um, some approaches to that one, one is, um, uh, uh, where, where they take some hyaluronic acid and combine it with a peptide. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've done some of this. It's interesting some patients will respond with a, a little bit of an immune reaction to that. Uh, this may be some of those people in that first category that would have benefited from a few months. It tends to be more women. It tends to be more, more especially women and postmenopausal women, AOHAD. Uh, 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 and so then uh, BPC-157 has been used by a lot of people intraarticular. And so then the issue is it's going to be super crucial that if you're doing joint injections with that, that you, um, you, you have something that's from a compounding pharmacy that's sterile because you don't yeah. want to have any, any, any issues around that. Right. And so then I would only do that if I had something from a compounding pharmacy that came as a liquid that wasn't reconstituted. Um, and I'm, we do uh, peptide injections into joints and have had very good experiences with it. We do a lot of other things intraarticular for joints. Um, and we have an evolving sort of experience with that. The exciting thing for me about, and the thing that I've had the most positive result with intraarticular has been BPC-157. And so, and that's a, that's a safe one to use. I have a lot of friends that have used it in particular. Uh, and I think it's, it's a, I think of it as generally a great anti-inflammatory. Um, uh, it's, I, I like using BPC-157 intraarticular as kind of a pre-treatment. And if it, if it fixes it, great. But I'm not thinking of it as a really profoundly uh, regenerative treatment in the joint, but I think of it as one of, one of, there's about three things that I like to do to kind of pre-treat a joint to calm it down. One is to use um, alpha-2 macroglobulin, one is to use ozone, and then one is to use BPC-157. Okay, that's pretty awesome right there. Actually, you mentioned something towards the end there that I wanted to transition to is the you know, let's, we've got to the path where you've done some hydro dissection, you've done maybe a joint injection, maybe some PRP or another uh, regenerative um, product. Now the injection is done. Is there, uh, you know, and we're kind of sticking to our big three here, the thymus and alpha one, beta, uh, beta four, and BPC. Are there any protocols that you use post injection? Like, all right, I've done the injection. Now I want you to do alpha one or beta four or BPC until I see you again or for a certain amount of time. Has there been some clinical uh, benefit to that? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so then it, de it depends on who, who they are mm -hmm. and sort of what's going on. Now, you, you'll, it be, you'll begin to experience that. This is kind of interesting. Certain type of patients, you'll see some people come in. A classic example is a, is a triathlete. They come in, they're ripped. They're, uh, they got no body fat and their muscles and nerves are kind of perfect. It's very common. So I'll see these guys, they come in, muscles and nerves are perfect, but they may have a tendon tear, which is pretty common, or they may have just a pure joint problem. Okay. Now that's option one. Option two is the person that kind of came in and they're kind of like the perineural patient where they've got a lot of nerve pain and a lot of fascial pain and a joint problem. So let's break those into kind of two, two categories. So then what I do is I teach them 
how to do peptide injections with BPC-157 and thymosin beta-4 in and around where their joint is. And so then, uh, as an example, so where the, for the knee, there's a, a point where the IT band and the hamstring come together. And then when you look, and I could do a video where I showed this to you, you there's a point where they kind of come close together and there's a little space. That's a common area on the outside of the knee where people will have a lot of pain. There's also a point where the, the fibula bone meets the tibia bone. There's, your, your leg is like a tuning fork. It goes from one bone to two bones. And where the two bones in the lower extremity meet, that's a classic area for inflammation. So I'll treat that one. Uh, there's about six targets that are pretty common on the inside of the knee. Um, by, the, by the patella, by the meniscus, by the tendons that are below the knee called the pes tendons, and then uh, uh, by the MCL, by the adductor tubercle, by, the, by where all of the groin muscles come in and attach, and then by this one muscle called the sartorius muscle, and then where the femoral nerve comes out at something called the adductor canal. Now, I just said a lot, but then each and every one of those I teach people, and my videos are going to teach people wh exactly where to find all of those points. And then, typically, if I bet you, if I sat down, you might have no pain at rest in those. But if I touched you and did an exam, you might have pain in two of those areas. So then, those are the two areas that I treat. Okay. If you, if I did a joint injection, but before I did my joint injection, I did an exam and you had pain where all of your groin muscles attach. And then let's say you had a little pain by your meniscus. Then what I would do is I would inject some peptides superficial to the meniscus and superficial to where all of those muscles and tendons attach. So then what I'm doing is I'm, and then what I would do is I would say, all right, big guy, you're going to do injections to these two spots for the next month, okay? But what, would, what will happen typically is that in reality, usually most of the pain in those two areas is gonna start to go away after three or four days. And so then you're gonna start to treat some of the other areas. And so once I've got you coached up and you know all those spots, then you're working your way through treating that knee and then usually what happens is people call me and they go, yeah, that was kind of awesome. And I did that for four or five days, but then the pain kind of went away. So I started treating my hip and it actually feels better. Yeah. Which is really cool. I'm looking forward to those videos. I really am. So just getting more techniques and, and learning more and all that. So that is great. Now, speaking of athletes, that's a question I wanted to ask you because I know there are certain, um, depending on the organization, whether it's VADA or USADA, can athletes use these peptides? Because I know for a while they were banned, um, especially BPC-157. I saw that one on the list as well. Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a really, really simple answer for this because there are so many regulatory agencies and they're all changing and they're, um, they're, it's, a, it's an evolving area. Uh, and it's highly likely that regulatory agencies may not allow this stuff. And so then as a result, what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to check with, uh, with your regulatory uh, agency around this stuff. And there's a, um, there's a, they're not gonna allow, most, most athletic regulatory agencies are not gonna allow most of these peptides um, at, at the current time and Which then is in, in the foreseeable shame. future. Yeah, and that's a shame because they're not performance enhancing. You know, we're not talking about growth hormones, critogogs, we're talking healing from an injury. And I guess if you, you say know, healing, fa thing. yeah, I guess if you say healing fa faster is performance enhancing, I'm, if you want to look at that way, but it's, it's just, it's, it's a, uh, a frustrating thing. And I guess you know, the thing is for the foreseeable future, it doesn't look like there's any way to get through to some of these people and that's the sad part about it well so, but this, is a, this is an educational moment so like mm -hmm. if i could speak to those you know regulatory agencies what i would say is 
we're we're beginning to have a better and better conceptualization of what we're up to. Mm -hmm. Somebody's racing uh, their car outside my office. Um, oh, there's there's an actual race just happened. <laughs> uh, that may be somebody that's gonna uh, get in a car accident and need a pain treatment soon. Oh man, just walk right over. There you go. But so then, <laughs> what's gonna happen is, you know, somebody has meniscus pain. We would like to put something that's healing and anti-inflammatory by the meniscus to try to heal that. And it turns out the data says that if somebody has a, a mild meniscus tear, they're going to do better without surgery than with surgery. Conservative treatment is going to do better. And one of the things that I want to do is start to do some clinical trials with peptides where we pick some of these easy conditions like meniscus tears and then start to treat people with peptides. And what we need to do is really do a good job on our side on the on on gathering data and and building a clinical model and then proving what our results are and then we need to then bring this to the to the sports agencies because so many people are chronically injured have a lot of problems have a lot of pain it's just difficult yeah, it, and hopefully we'll get there soon. And so this is definitely going to be part one because there's so much we didn't talk about, even in the pain space, like we didn't get through, you know, we didn't get, we wanted to focus on those three, but we could have branched off into CGC 1295 at Pomoraland. We could have branched off into AOD 9604. And there's so many peptides that could be complementary in this space, but the big three, uh, I'm glad we had an opportunity to deep dive on those. And I'm hoping that anyone listening, you know, physicians and patients, including can get a lot from this because these are, you know, this isn't the information you're going to get going to your, your PCP or a lot of orthopedists, you know, that aren't familiar with this. And it's like, um, how can we get someone better without making surgery the first option, you know, and that's something I hope people get out of this. And so I'm excited about it because I have learned a lot from this. And I told you, Dr. Cook, I was going to throw you softballs, man, just let you hit them. And oh, so, <laughs> you know what, I like to tell everybody, I spent the first half of my career putting people to sleep and facilitating surgery. Mm -hmm. And I'm spending the second half of my career waking them up and preventing surgery. Which so, is awesome. Which that's is and awesome. so then what we'll do is we'll pick uh, three more peptides for our next talk, and yep. we'll just rock and roll with those, and uh, and then we're just going to work our way through them. Oh, I'm excited about that because this is a great topic, and I'm you know I'm I'm thankful, man. I'm glad that you took some time to do this for us today. Now, before I get you out of here, I want to make sure we let people know where to find you. Oh yeah, so find us at um, BioReset. Uh, dot com okay. and uh my podcast is bioresetpodcast.com and um be delighted to have you guys with us and we're doing more or less almost every week some calls but then we're about to switch to to having more content coming out but we're still awesome. doing a couple podcasts every week Awesome. Awesome. So guys, make sure you check that out. Once again, thank you, Dr. Cook. And we'll be seeing more of you. This has been great. And you know, we're gonna do more. I'm excited. So all right, everyone, that is it. And we will see you again soon. Mm -hmm.